Hi, good morning. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm Scott Ford. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Techstars. I'm excited to be here this morning to partner with Junior Achievement to kick off this terrific event today. For those of you who aren't familiar with Techstars, we help entrepreneurs like the one you're going to meet today succeed. We do this through our 40 plus accelerator programs we have around the globe helping fund entrepreneurs in their quest to bring new, exciting innovation to the world. Techstars was founded with three core principles. Entrepreneurs create a better future, collaboration drives innovation, and most importantly, great ideas can come from anywhere. We're very proud of the things that we've done for the ecosystem here in Colorado and beyond. Today, we've, we've funded over 2,500 companies uh, in their drive to be successful. This includes 12 different unicorns, including companies like SendGrid, DataRobot, and PillPack. We're super excited to be partnering with these organizations who have gone on to raise over $12 billion and collectively are worth over $37 billion and have hired and employed tens of thousands of people. It's a tremendous day to be an entrepreneur and we're very excited to be part of this organization. So with that, I'd like to turn this over and introduce you to Robin Wise, President and CEO of Junior Achievement. Good morning. I want to thank you on behalf of Junior Achievement and the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce. We're so glad you tuned in to the Colorado Business Hall of Fame Summit. It's a first and we're really excited. Uh, when you look at all of the inductees of the Colorado Business Hall of Fame, it's a who's who of the men and women who have shaped this state, our communities, and the way we live. We're delighted to welcome two of these individuals, Jim Johnson and Larry Kendall this morning. Junior Achievement knows that, that young people learn best when they have exposure to multiple role models and perspectives. So we're also delighted to welcome two alumni from Techstars, uh, David Potter and e Elena Vaughn Phillips, who are demonstrating what a bright and innovative future we have. All four of our panelists are incredible role models for what you can do with your future. We extend a huge thanks to our education sponsor, UMB Bank, for making today's summit possible, as well as Techstars, the Denver Business Journal, Denver 7, and all of our sponsors. It's my, my pleasure to introduce today's MC, Denver 7, Brian Sanders. Hi, everybody, and thank you, Robin. Yes, um, super excited to be here with you guys today. I actually, uh, I just got off the air here. So uh, uh, we, we are on the air from 4.30 to 9 every morning. So I'm a few minutes removed from our newscast, but uh, excited to be with you guys uh, talking about um, the, the powerful businesses and, and startups in our community. And uh, we're going to be hearing from some industry titans, some pillars in our Colorado business community. We're also going to be hearing from some newcomers who are kind of forging their own paths with their startup businesses. So I hope to learn a lot from all of our panelists today. Uh, I'm a morning news anchor at Denver 7. I am also our business beat reporter. I have a series here called In Good Company. And um, that is where we feature a Colorado owned business each week to highlight kind of what makes them unique. We have such a strong entrepreneurial uh, spirit here in Colorado community, so supportive of one another. And there's such an affinity to support Colorado-based uh, products and services. So uh, we use that series to, to highlight those companies. Uh, want to introduce our panelists today. We are joined by two of Colorado's most influential business leaders. They are Jim Johnson of GE Johnson Construction Company and Larry Kendall of the group real estate firm, both of whom are inductees into the Colorado Business Hall of Fame. And we're going to be hearing from them here in just a second. We are also joined by two entrepreneurs who are newer to the scene, but already making a huge impact. As I mentioned, we're going to hear about their startups and what led them into business and how things are going. They are Elena Vaughn Phillips and David Potter. So thank you uh, to all of our panelists for being here. So I want to explain a little bit about how the next hour is going to go. We do have some questions that were previously submitted in advance. So I'm going to be asking our panelists some of those questions. But I want to encourage you uh, who are watching this discussion, um, whether you are already in business, I understand we have some students 
and some teachers who may be joining us. So I encourage your participation and, and be sure to submit any questions that you might have for our panelists. And I'll be checking our chat to try to get to those um, as much as I can throughout our discussion. Uh, so thank you for joining us online. Uh, we are recording today's event. And so starting next week, you will be able to view this on the Denver 7 app for all the major streaming platforms like Roku and Amazon Fire and Apple TV. All right, wanna introduce our panelists one by one, get a brief background on their companies and, and them as uh, business leaders. So we wanna start with Jim Johnson of GE Johnson Construction Company. Good morning. Thank you, Brian. I'm Jim Johnson. I'm president and CEO of GE Johnson Construction Company in Colorado Springs. I'm a second generation general contractor. And when I think about entrepreneurship, um, sometimes um, you can hop into a very traditional business, but it's how you build that business and how you build that culture that really defines your entrepreneurship. I look forward to your questions today and learning more. Thank you. So I wanna introduce one of our newcomers, uh, Elena Von Phillips here to talk a little bit about her startup business and a little about herself. Good morning, Elena. Good morning, Brian, thanks. <laughs> so I'm Elena Von Phillips. Um, I'm based here in Evergreen, Colorado, up in the mountains. Um, I am co-founder and chief development officer of a uh, very new startup. It's called Boba Vida. Um, we are a clean uh, food tech company um, and the first and only producer of popping boba in the US. So I can get into a little bit more about that later, but it's a, a really <laughs> exciting, um, unique technology and uh, it, it fits in with a, a previous startup that I had um, a few years ago that was a, um, a clean denim textile tech, uh, technology company. So I, I really like cleaning up dirty businesses. <laughs> um, I also uh, currently lead um, a digital innovation initiative for Energize Colorado. Um, which is a nonprofit started by Brad Feld, um, who's the founder of Techstars, as many of you probably know. And um, I also lead partnerships at a, another startup. It's a, a global startup, actually, called Go Running Tours, which does uh, site running tours all around the world. So I'm a busy person <laughs> involved in a lot of different things, but um, the underlying theme is that uh, they're all just trying to change uh, little pieces of the world here and there, wherever we can. Yeah, a lot of irons in the fire there for sure. Um, and pretty wild when you when you look at her website at the Boba Vita product. Uh, so thank you. Look forward to hearing from you. Um, okay, uh, Larry Kendall is here who established the group real estate firm. And uh, Larry, good morning. Good morning, Brian. Thanks for uh, the introduction. Uh, my background, I actually uh, helped start two companies. Our first was the uh, real estate company in Northern Colorado. Uh, we received some national recognition for our productivity. Uh, we were ranked as the most productive real estate company in America in terms of transactions per associate. And people began to ask how we do that. And I said, well, I can show you. And that led to um, creating a sales training program called Ninja Selling. And um, that has grown now to the point where we are training about a thousand students a month in uh, a little over 20 countries. Um, uh, there is a book, if you're interested, called Ninja Selling that I authored. And so uh, that's what we, uh, that's what my primary focus is today. I retired from uh, the group real estate company a couple of years ago and focus on, uh, on uh, the sales training uh, the company at this point. Yes, and we're going to hear more about the Ninja selling system here in a little bit and how it applies to a lot of different industries, not just real estate. Um, and lastly, we have David Potter, who uh, has started up a company called Kuru to uh, hopefully help people get approved for some loans. Good morning. Hey, good morning, Brian. And how's it going, everybody? Um, so as Brian said, I'm David Potter, the CEO and co-founder of Kuru. I'm calling in from uh, over here in Denver. And a little bit more on Kuru. It started off as a consumer app. So we had an app in the app store for a number of years and it was aimed to help people improve their credit scores. And then um, I guess just a little bit of background on that. I'm not sure you know, how many people may be you know, pretty vetted in building their credit scores, but it ends up being 
um, a pretty important factor for getting housing, cars, et cetera. Um, and then through our evolution, we ended up partnering with banks um, in order to give like your applicants a path to approval. So if you're applying and your credit score would be too low um, to bridge that path, so you have an action plan. Um, so I'm going to be happy to share with you guys a little bit more of like that founder journey or any of those insights around there. So starting from um, the ground up and building that up quite a bit. Um, in my experience and the reason how, um, you know, kind of found myself getting into credit was uh, when I was in college, I was studying on a full ride from Bill Gates. Um, but due to that, I didn't really have an established credit score. So after getting rejected, it really just started with a personal problem that I was facing and really digging into that, learning more about finances for myself and how to help other people with finances. Um, so from this to that, we got into the Techstars Western Union program, um, which is based out here in Denver. Um, and then uh, since then, we went on to raise about $3 million, um, or a little bit more than that in capital. Um, so with that being said, happy to share with you guys um, a bit of that journey and answer any of the questions that you guys have. Yeah, congratulations on that uh, on that three million in funding. That's huge, and and I'll and I'll, I want to start our discussion just kind of opening up a question to to all four of you, um, and 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 what inspired you to start your own business and to get involved in the industry that you are currently in. I I can kick that off since I was just going, um, but on my side, um, I'm just a big um like advocate in business to start with a real problem so instead of just pursuing um a sporadic opportunity if you've actually faced a problem um at least you have a data point of one that you know something's wrong here and there might be another thousand or a million people that face that same problem so i think um you have a really strong foundation if you start with a true problem and in my case it was that um not only did i get rejected for housing or like 10 apartments i was applying for because i didn't have credit but then when i was asking other students um, or even parents they also didn't completely have an understanding of credit either. Um, so I knew what I was working on um, was a real problem, and therefore um, there'd be a real solution um, or opportunity behind it. So um, I got really frustrated because you know it prevented me from you know kind of moving forward um, in life or kind of what I would expect to be that next step. Um, and just following that passion um, was a strong energy source for me. So um, I guess just just solving a genuine problem um, made me pretty passionate and inspired me. Brian, I'll jump in next. Uh, uh, what inspired me was to live in Colorado. I grew up in Kansas uh, and uh, wanted to live in the mountains or in, in Colorado. And so my wife and I came out here. And at the time, there was a recession and I could not find a job. I have an MBA, but nobody was hiring. And so if you want to live someplace and you can't find a job, you can always go into sales. And so that's what I did. I found myself in the real estate sales business. Uh, really until I could find a, a real job. But I discovered after about a year that uh, I, I loved it. And so I was uh, in my career. And so um, <clears throat> that was uh, that was how it started for me. I can jump in, Brian. Uh, my situation was a little bit different. <clears throat> um, I grew up working construction as a kid, fell in love with just seeing the change um, every day when I left the job site of um, that self-esteem of, you know, hey, I did this today. And then when I got into management, I very quickly, probably like a lot of us, um, had the opportunity to sell the company. And I felt um, I had the passion for the industry, kind of like David said, but also I felt there was a void in what I wanted to do with our company. Um, I saw a, a niche that I believe was not getting addressed in the Rocky Mountain region. And I really wanted to um, shepherd and lead our company into that effort. All right. Adding to that, <laughs> um, I think it, it's interesting. I, I I feel like entrepreneurship found me. Um, so I just happened to be in kind of the right places at the right time. Um, but I think what underlied that was uh, just an intense and innate curiosity for for everything around me. So I've always kind of uh, kept my eyes open and observed uh, all of the things happening around me. And, um, and what I love is uh, making connections between seemingly um, unrelated things. And so when these opportunities came to me, um, I was in the right position to, you know, connect what was happening in different industries and uh, be able to turn that into a, you know, a viable business idea that, that you know, solved a real problem. <laughs> As David said, I think that is a really good place to start um, is, is solving actual problems. 
Yeah, that uh, that's an inherent theme, you know, for all four of you and, and a lot of entrepreneurs is just uh, that drive to solve a, a problem in society or in business. And um, we want to kind of dig into that mentality a little bit. And Larry, I want to start with you because you touched on it earlier. You developed this ninja selling system uh, for real estate, which is in, in training models, you know, throughout the country now, but it can really kind of be applied to a lot of different industries. Explain the Ninja selling system and what it involves. Sure, Brian. And I want to follow up on something Alana said. I think all of us, uh, one of our mission statements <clears throat> is to help people go from the life they have to the life they dream about. And so it's about helping people get <clears throat> move forward in their lives. And that's uh, that's what, what we do in, <clears throat> in our real estate company and also in our training program. Um, you know, what we've learned over the years is there's really three success keys in any business, whether you're in sales or any business. And those three success keys are number one, your mindset, how you run your brain, uh, your focus, your ability to focus. Uh, number two, your skill set. Uh, skills come with practice. You have to learn your craft. And number three is, is your actions, the actions that you take on a daily basis. So what we know is we don't decide our future, we decide our habits and our habits decide our future. And so the actions that we take every day are really important. Uh, there's quite a bit of research on this. The most important hour of your day is the first hour. What you do when you first get up in the morning, uh, starts your routine for the day. Do you have good habits? One of the things that we recommend that you start each day with is your gratitudes. What is it that you're grateful for? This puts you in a positive energy state, which is part of your mindset. And so uh, on your mindset, you want to uh, try to stay positive. You want to limit the amount of negativity that comes in uh, to your world and try to keep in the, uh, the positive energy, uh, what we call quadrants. So uh, mindset, skill set, and actions, uh, true in sales, true in any, really in any, any career. Yeah, a, a great, great, obviously a great way to start the day with that kind of an attitude. And that, you know, a negative attitude would reflect, I'm sure, in your work as you're talking with your potential clients. Are there misconceptions about sales out there that you feel need to be addressed? Well, I think traditional selling, first of all, if you look at the, uh, the history of the word sales, uh, it comes from a, an old English word salon, which means to serve. So original uh, sales was to serve, but uh, I think the traditional, uh, what, what people think of sales is manipulation or high pressure. Um, and uh, this is the kind of portrayed in the movies or TV shows of salespeople. And um, uh, a true sales is serving uh, and is helping people get from the life they have to the life they dream about. And um, I think that's the approach that we've taken with Ninja Selling. One, I've trained you know, thousands of salespeople and what I find is their greatest fear is a fear of rejection. And so they're afraid that uh, the, the, the customer is going to reject them. Well, the reason for that is because uh, they've put the customer under pressure. And so our philosophy is never put your customer under pressure. Uh, and if you don't put your customer under pressure, number one, they're gonna be happier. And number two, you're never gonna be rejected. So uh, our approach to sales is to um, ask questions, identify pain and pleasure, try to be a, a problem solver, try to serve, and uh, never ever put your, your customer, your client, and, uh, under pressure. Yeah, good points. Um, Jim, I want to turn it over to you, talk a little bit about GE Johnson, which has, has been involved in expanding some of uh, the iconic you know, structures here in Colorado from the Broadmoor to the yeah. training center and, and what has made your company kind of stand out above the rest uh, here in the state? Great question. And I always learn so much um, listening on these type of panels and so much of what um, Larry's uh, book is about, plus of what he just articulated is, is so true. Um, and, and sometimes we try to overthink it. And I think what G. Johnson has tried to do and what I've tried to shepherd um, is it's a little bit longer race. Um, you've got to manage your day-to-day -day decisions um, to a little longer horizon. 
um, and build those relationships and really produce that quality and that excellence <clears throat> that allows you the future opportunities to work at places like the United States Olympic Museum, um, the Broadmoor. It isn't just a job, it really is a career and sustainable company operations. And that approach doesn't sound all that novel, but in our industry, um, a lot of people are just trying to hit a quick home run and maximize um, their returns on a single project. And where we've tried to really recognize um, the customer culture and a lot of the sales culture that, you know, that Larry speaks at as well. Um, and that's a little bit non-traditional in our industry. Um, so that's probably, that is what has led us <laughs> to be not only a good builder, but a good company. Because there's a lot of people that can build great structures, but we wanted to build a really good company and embracing our values um, and, and having those perpetuate themselves. Yeah, having a, a true impact on the community. And it's sometimes difficult to have that long-term vision you know, that you guys are referring to. Like you said, a lot of people want that uh, quick satisfaction. Right. Uh, you, you. This is a multi generational family business for you. What, yeah. What lessons did you learn from the previous generations or from your dad that you've been able to carry in your company? Yeah, and I don't know all the numbers exactly, and I, Robin probably knows them. But the failure of second generation businesses, construction businesses, was second only to restaurant failures. Um, so you um, kind of keep that in your rearview mirror at all times. And I just absolutely was driven not to be that guy. And um, one of the questions in the chat box is, you know, what was the most significant challenge that you faced? And it's the fear of failure, you know, as, as Larry said. And I fortunately, or, or unfortunately, I had failed a bunch in my academic um, career um, and uh, would have to repeat classes. But I knew what the end goal was. I wanted that diploma. And it was the hard work of having to go back in that class that you failed, you know, but the sun still came up and the world was still moving. And I had to change my approach and style to get through those classes. So I knew I could handle failure. I knew I could survive. I had the self-confidence and the self-esteem to saying I can get myself up. Um, I failed. Um, but I wanna keep going, I, I know my goal. So I think a lot of that allowed our company to grow um, knowing that we can handle failure as opposed to becoming very restrictive on the opportunities and just trying to preserve um, what the company had at that point. Yeah, and, and thank you McKenna, uh, eighth grader honor student from Fort Collins for that question too. Um, Elena, I want to turn it over to you. I mean, you, you've, you've, you've done a lot. You've started a, a lot of businesses and you're, you're, you're juggling a lot. What was it that inspired you to kind of tackle a lot of things at once? And what advice would you have for someone who is looking to start their own business? Yeah. <laughs> so I would say um, I wouldn't necessarily advise being so involved in so many different things. Um, it is quite a, a strain on uh our, our most limited resource, which is our time. Um, but I would say that it's, and especially for, for young people, and I feel like every opportunity I've ever had has come out of having a lot of interest and pursuing multiple interests at the same time. Um, it's how you learn. It's how you understand what, you know, what your innate talents are, what you enjoy doing, um, what you're interested in. And then you can put those things together and, you know, make, make businesses, make careers for yourself. Um, so I think in, in that sense, it's actually, you know, a good thing to try a bunch of different things um, because you can learn from every one of those experiences. Um, and, and I'd say in terms of starting a business, uh, it's, you know, for me, <laughs> my business has found, found me. Um, and like I said earlier, it was because I had been involved in, in multiple different things and I was able to make those connections between, you know, different industries and, and different, um, 
educational disciplines. <laughs> um, so not just being, you know, strictly a finance person or strictly a marketing person, having that overview of, of all of the different pieces to a business is really helpful when you're trying to start a business um, and having that interest and curiosity in all of the different aspects of a business. Um, you really need that. Even if you're um, like me, I'm, I'm not the CEO of my, my company, um, but I support the CEO of the company by understanding the different areas of the business and being able to keep our business moving forward um, because of having that understanding of the different areas of the business. So my advice is, is you know, follow your interests and, um, and, and try to see the connections between these unrelated things. And, and that's where you can uh, find new ideas and, and pursue you know, new business ideas is, is at that intersection between those two seemingly unrelated things. That's where a lot of innovation happens. Right, right. You gotta have the passion uh, and love what you're doing. Also have to fund it or find a way to fund starting a business, which is another uh, challenge. And I wanna open it up to David and Elena both because you are uh, starting up a business. How did you go about finding a uh, finding funding. Um, in terms of funding, I think definitely a, um, a journey and a skill set that like over time you get better at, but like progressing through those stages, I would say, or at least in the, the path that I've took or with other uh, founders addressing that early stage funding problem, it could be really awkward asking anyone for money, whether it's like family, friends, a mentor to you, um, whatever the case is so i wouldn't especially you know if you're like starting out i'd probably say start out with like investing your own time energy resources if you have a little bit of money to put in like kick it off because it does show that you're committed to something you really believe in and i think at that point you would have built up more of the self-esteem or just the validation in yourself that it's something i'm taking serious and you'll be willing to ask a parent a relative um if you have a mentor in your network um maybe a teacher that like really trusts or believes in what you're doing um, but I would say start with like people that are close to you and you have a really strong relationship with. And that may be able to get you, um, you know, it depends on what you're starting, but it may be able to get you, you know, whatever you need to get started because you actually don't need, you know, as much as you may imagine. You can do a lot with a little bit. Um, and then from there, though, in terms of um, funding outside of, say, like family and friends and that, you know, initial stage of people you know, um, maybe I would ask for, um, like referrals if anyone knows anyone else because that could always be um, a good source you can ask your parents if they know someone who might be interested they might pull in like your godfather or whatever the case is but then outside of that as well um i do think that there's a lot of competitions so, like pitch competitions um where if you perform well you'll get a lot of exposure um which will help your company and you may end up winning i think typically competitions will give you know at least a few hundred if not you know a number of thousands for the competition and has a pretty big range of the amount that they can give um, and then there's accelerators, which I'm a big fan of. Um, an accelerator, if you guys aren't familiar, um, and earlier you mentioned Techstars, which is um, um, one of the ones that um, a few of us here have um, been a part of. Um, but an accelerator gives you mentorship, uh, money, and like a boot camp of a program to make sure that like you're geared up and ready to take your company to the next stage. And an earlier stage accelerator may give maybe like 20,000 or 40,000 in capital and like um, one like Techstars or say Y Combinator may give like 125,000 in capital. So that can really take your company to the next stage and kick off a lot of the momentum for getting into, if you're planning on raising larger funding than that can you know, kick you off to um, a bigger stage of funding. But there's a lot of programs. So whatever you're doing, whether it's clothing, whether it's like something social impact, there's like a program or accelerator for all of it. Um, so do a Google search, search for accelerators with whatever you're looking at, and you'll be surprised what you'll find. Now, I'll just add to that. Um, David's absolutely right in terms of, of starting with your, uh, your kind of inner circle, your, your family and friends. Um, I'd say that the really important thing to nail is your value proposition. Um, it's, it's really important to understand, you know, what is the problem that you're trying to solve and what is your unique solution for it and why people should care. Um, because without that, you know, if you're just asking for money, 
um, and, and you don't have <laughs> a problem that you're trying to solve or a solution for it, then you're not going to go very far with your fundraising. So those are really key uh, aspects to, to nail down. I would also say that, um, you know, I, I had a lot of success in my first startup with uh, applying for grants um, and, and getting money that way because we were uh, bringing manufacturing back to the U.S. Um, so it was in a, a textile um, you know, manufacturing capacity and our whole value proposition is that a lot of this has been outsourced. It used to be made in the USA um, and then it wasn't and we're trying to bring it back. So there's a lot of grant money, um, a lot of programs, you know, run by the government, run by um, cities and states at the state level where, you know, their motivation is to bring jobs to the state. Um, Colorado has a great program um, through uh, OEdit, um, the Advanced Industries Grant, where you know they're trying to um, motivate and, and generate jobs and economic development for the state of Colorado, uh, and and some of the grants are you know up to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars if you have a good product market fit um, that can show how your business is. Um, is, is going to actually generate new jobs and economic development for the state of Colorado. So there's money out there um, in these programs. They're competitive. They're you know, involved uh, application processes that you know, really make you um, be clear about you know, the problem you're trying to solve, how you're gonna solve it, and how you're going to uh, actually bring jobs to the state um, that you're in or to the you know, United States in general. Um, but there is a lot of, uh, of, of money out there um, through these programs. And, and that's another good way to look at, at fundraising. You know, Brian, if I could offer uh, Please. an idea, uh, kind of a unique idea on fundraising as well. What I did was um, I identified the top 15 to 20 salespeople in our market, real estate people. And I went to them and, and I uh, invited them to form a company. And so 12 of them took me up on it. And uh, they all threw money in. Uh, I did as well. We started our company called the Group Real Estate Company. And uh, just like Elena says, you have to have a value proposition. If you're going to be raising money, there has to be a benefit for them to do that, to leave where they are, to start uh, a new company and put money into it. And if you can articulate that, uh, then I think that's another option for you. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Um, and and. Elena, I want to, well, there was a, a viewer question that I wanted to kind of open up to all four of you, but you touched on it earlier, Elena, that you are not the CEO of your company. Um, but I wanted to ask you, being a founder, uh, being so close to the company as, it's, as a founder or co-founder or CEO, how involved are you with your employees and what attributes are you looking for when you hire? That's a, a great question. Um, I think, you know, very involved. I mean, when you're on a founding team, it doesn't matter what your title is. You're all founders and you're all equally, uh, you know, trying to, to move the ball up the field uh, to use a football analogy. Um, so, you know, the, the titles are arbitrary. Um, you know, it's almost like you, you just have to have them for kind of external reasons, but um, when you're inside, you're, you're very uh, much all on the same team, you know, putting in uh, the same effort to, to try to get your business off the ground. Um, so, you know, we're very involved in, in hiring decisions and um, vetting, you know, who we want to work with. It's, it's not just employees, it's also like customers and, um, you know, and, and other uh, people that you might need to, to work with to get your business off the ground. So, I think it's it's important that everybody be involved and in, and um, you know the the kinds of things that you look for passion and uh, and and work ethic um, and, and making sure that you know everybody's um, aligned around the same values uh, because I think you know I, I learned in my first startup that when you're not aligned around the same values it's it's very hard to uh, move forward with your business. Um, so that was something that I learned and that I've kept with me 
um, over the years is to really make sure that uh, everybody that's involved in your business is working towards the same um, purpose and values. Uh, and, and that will <laughs> make a huge difference um, in, in the success of your company. Anyone else? Yeah, I'll add in on that as well. Um, I think um, just to relook at the question, so how involved should you be with your employees? Um, so I, I would agree with what Alana said. I think you know definitely as a founder or a co-founder is it's you know you need to be united by a common like goal and mission. So everyone's working towards the same thing, and um, you're also kind of doing everything, especially at the early stages. So I think as things grow, eventually you begin to specialize more. Um, but how I would say, like currently at a stage, is I think um, I would like put the balance is you need to be as involved as you need to be, um, but not micromanage. I think a good balance that I've been finding where you lose a lot of time yourself if like you have a team member that you're relying on, but like you need to help them out for every minute of their work, and like that's not to the net benefit of the goal. Versus you know having someone who's you know competent, you guys can rely on each other in that way. When you guys get together, you can make, you know, even better results happen. You come to like quality control checks and then whatever the case is, but as involved as you need to be without micromanaging. Um, but at the beginning, you're doing everything and all hands are on deck. So I wouldn't be too worried about micromanaging. If it's just a few people, you guys have to do everything. Um, and then um, eventually when, you know, things do get to a point where you're specializing, I would say being self-aware is really important. So understanding um, where your strengths are, what you're good in, what you enjoy doing, what you don't enjoy doing. Um, and knowing that for your team as well, because then you can, you know, allow people to lean into where they're strong and spend less time at something that you might take, you know, eight times as long as another person in that same area. Um, that's probably more of a luxury when, you know, and being at like a later stage company or taking a company um, to to get to that opportunity. Yeah. yeah, completely agree with everything David just said. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, switching gears a little bit. I'm sorry, Larry, did you want to add to that? No. Okay. They covered it. They did a beautiful job. Okay. I agree. I totally agree. <laughs> um, switching gears a little bit. Uh, let's talk about, you know, this unprecedented year that we're coming off of and, and it's still going, but how has COVID and the pandemic changed business for any of you guys? I'll go first, if that's okay. Uh, it changed our business pretty dramatically. 80% um, of our uh, revenue, 80% of our training is live training. So uh, suddenly within a week, uh, we're 80% of our revenue, uh, all of our courses were canceled. Um, you know, our, our, our staff is worried about, are they gonna lose their jobs? We said, no, uh, we'll find a way. Uh, it required us to uh, create some digital solutions, some training that was online. Um, our core course is a four-day uh, course. Uh, it's difficult to do a four-day course and uh, online. So that course we had to put on the shelf, but we created some other courses that were one hour to one day courses that actually, because we did that, then we had the demand from international companies wanting to know if we could deliver the, the course to them, which we could now because uh, we had that. So now we're in over 20 countries doing training. So uh, it, it turned out to be, uh, in, in some ways, a, a benefit to us uh, to have done that. Yeah, an opportunity um, that you found. Anyone else? Has COVID impacted how you do things? I think, uh, Brian, our industry was a little bit different um, uh, at, at roughly a year ago, right? Um, we were working in um, 42 different jurisdictions in seven states um, the day that everybody kind of shut down. And um, nobody was fully prepared for this type of um, activity um, and exactly what it meant. And so, you know, you quickly grab your, your your crisis management team or whatever, whoever your advisors are and, you know, how are we going to work through this? Construction was allowed to work through um, uh, the pandemic. And we felt that was a good thing and a fortunate thing, but it also uh, 
made us get very creative on how we solved some of the social distancing and some of the PPE issues. If you recall, they were so short of um, in supply about a year ago. And I love the innovation and creativity that uh, our various job sites came up with. And everybody, you know, Lenexa, Kansas has a different set of rules than Boulder, than, um, and how they adapted and that ingenuity that really came that allowed our people to keep working. I think um, we want to keep that. Um, and, you know, how we learned um, all of a sudden we have 250 people working remotely, you know, what it did to our systems. Um, so, you know, now we're evaluating the, the work from home versus office type environment. Those changes, I think, will stay. Um, but it really, as a leader, um, you've got to engage. Um, your people are looking for direction during that highly uncertain time. Um, you know, so I had to be very visible. Um, and that was a tough time to do that. Um, but I think it was a lot of good lessons learned. Um, and I'm very proud of the resiliency that our company um, put up. But every day I went home, you cannot forget that those, your workers have families at home too. And some of the other challenges there, um, you know, we developed a school program. Um, we developed some other things to try to support our employees um, through this pandemic as well. So good, good things came out of it. Yeah, happy equal productive workforce a lot of times. So, um, any uh, David or Elena? Yeah, I, I think I'm in a, a bit of a unique situation because um, of of everybody on this panel. I think I'm the only one who started my business in the pandemic. Good point. Um, <laughs> so I think there's some interesting lessons uh, learned from this because, uh, like I said, I, I had a previous startup. Um, you know, this started a few years ago, and that was in in uh, denim. It was it was basically a textile technology um, that had fashion implications, but it was it was cleaning up a dirty industry. But um, if, if I had tried to start that business now, it wouldn't make any sense because who cares about that? Who's wearing jeans right now when everything is done <laughs> by, by Zoom? You know, maybe the, the jackets would have done well because it'll look cool on, on a Zoom call, but um, you know, it's, it's less of an issue. And so in starting this, uh, this, this food technology business, Boba Vida, um, you know, again, it was cleaning up a dirty, you know, business. Um, but I think, you know, one of the uh, decisions that I had to make joining this startup um, was, you know, is this an industry that is pandemic and recession proof? Uh, and, you know, yes, <laughs> it, it, it was and it is. And I think had it been a different industry, had it been a different startup idea, um, I might not have, have, have made the same decision. So I think, um, you know, in times like these, when you're really forced to look at what's important and what's not, and food is one of the most important things that's always going to be a need for people, um, you know, whether it's uh, the basics, you know, uh, vegetables and, and farming, or whether it's something a bit more um, fun and, and just a, an add-in like what we're doing, it's still important and it's still going to be um, a product that is going to um, last beyond uh, or, or still be in demand during, um, you know, a recession time or a pandemic time like we're in right now. So I think, you know, that's really important when looking at, you know, making a decision of, of starting a business in a pandemic is, you know, what industry are you looking to disrupt and, and is it going to be the, an industry that um, can withstand these ups and downs. And I think there are certain industries like healthcare and like, uh, you know, food technology that are always going to be in demand. Um, so that would be my advice for, <laughs> for the audiences to, to be really, um, you know, picky about which industry you're, you're starting your business in. Yeah, certainly. I'll just, chime in there as well, um, since, since you asked Brian, but I, I would agree as well, uh, what Lana said, I think coming in and it's hard to predict everything, but at least with, you know, some, there's a lot of risk already. So coming in with at least an industry that does have some level of base, at least that 
can keep your, yourself sane because every single company and every single person, I'm sure everyone's like family had it. And every single person here, everyone's like wearing a mask, I'm sure, when you go outside. So um, like everyone's been impacted by it and it's changed so much. So, um, you know, just having that level of, um, you know, reliability or, you know, less things to, you know, pull out your hair um, definitely, you know, pays off a lot as well versus having to solve one extra major thing. Um, that'll be a big uphill battle um, depending on what industry you're in. So like if you had a restaurant, uh, I'm sure it was, you know, pretty hard for a lot of restaurants. Okay. Um, nonetheless, though, um, on our side, I'd kind of say the good and the bad. Um, I'm part of the transition, I'm working remotely, having largely, you know, like a technology team. A lot of us have, you know, done Zoom, et cetera, um, throughout. And um, so that wasn't much of an adjustment for us in terms of like workflows and getting work done. Um, the team was pretty efficient. Um, so um, that was fine. We did have to wait for like some banks or other partners to kind of figure that out over a few months. But um, there was like nothing major there. So that worked out pretty well. But then um, in terms of um, the like negative side or how it forced us to react is, uh, and I'm going to give us like a, a big analogy because I feel like talking on technology, things just get confusing. Um, so we had to do what you guys may hear more often at some point, or maybe you've heard it before, but we had to pivot um, to make sure that we were listening to our customers in the market and not sell a product for, you know, that was for the market yesterday or a year ago that they were no longer looking for. Um, so to give like an analogy, if you were selling, so you had like a clothing company and you were selling t-shirts, um, but there was like a blizzard, like the pandemic, like 12 months, if you're still selling t-shirts, you're probably not going to make many sales versus if you switched over to selling coats or something. So we had to make sure that we're listening to the market and just positioning or purposing a solution to where they were actually focusing on. Um, so that took us, I mean, maybe three to six months, um, just as we we're like navigating it. So right now we're in a, you know, a healthier spot. We're able to see um, you know, the exact plan that we're executing on, but we had to make sure that instead of selling the older product, we were like spending the time to listen to, uh, spending the time to listen to our partners. Yeah. Um, and we're, we, we've only got about 10 more minutes here, but I wanted to, uh, to reach back and ask a question from our chat once again, and this will be opened up to anyone, but as a, a founder of a company and a CEO or president, what are some tough decisions that you've had to make or big decisions that have really affected, um, you know, the company, you know, with, with whatever you decided? Or don't want to reveal that. <laughs> I think for us, it was what I just mentioned. Uh, that was a, <clears throat> a tough decision for us to, um, we had built our, our business on live training and, and to have to uh, be forced to uh, find other alternatives. Uh, that was a challenge for us. Uh, when, um, you know, in one week, pretty much uh, nine months of revenue was canceled out and uh, everybody's kind of a deer in the headlights wondering, okay, what are we going to do now? So that was uh, the most recent challenge for us. Um, in, the, in the real estate business, I can still remember when the, uh, Mortgage rates hit 17%. Prime rate was 21%. We had money borrowed at two over prime. We were at 23%. Um, I remember those were scary times. I remember that we uh, we went a year and a half uh, uh, in our company without anybody selling a house with a new loan. Uh, everything was owner financing or creative financing or, you know, so you have to be able to sail through those challenges and, uh, it requires flexibility. It requires grit. Um, and sometimes you'll lay awake at night wondering, how's it, how are we going to get through this? But uh, we always seem to find a way. And um, so uh, those are a couple of my thoughts. Yeah, Brian, I can jump in. I uh, can kind of remember, obviously, the construction industry has hit very hard um, during those times. Um, that Larry just talked about as well. But I, I think the ones that are the hardest um, for me always come down to people um, when you've got to let somebody go. And really that evaluation of, has the company done their part that'll, that could have allowed them to succeed? And uh, a lot of times they're, they're, they're very nice people. Um, but uh, you know, making that decision that the, the business has to move forward and um, letting the people go. I think the people decisions are probably the hardest um, for me. Certainly, yeah. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll jump on that too. I think I was, in my mind, I was hovering on, um, it's not one of the, the more challenging, not, if not the most challenging, definitely one of the more challenging ones. Um, Jim, like, primed me to agree with that as well. Um, not only is it harder to, like, you know, fire or let go of someone who's, like, working towards the same mission, um, you know, in there in the trenches with you day in and day out, you know, they're putting in that quality work, but then you have to, um, again, ma again, maybe it was, they came in the company too early and it wasn't by time, whatever the case is, so maybe it is on the company, but, you know, if it doesn't work, um, you know, it doesn't work and that's a hard decision, let alone um, in my company, I've had the pleasure on both sides of working with like two of my best friends at a point. So one of them is my co-founder. Um, we're in really good relationship, like great relationship. We've been roommates since like freshman year in college. So um, great relationship there. And I think having a co-founder, a partner is really healthy, but that relationship is a very unique one because um, similar to what Lana was saying, it's lesser of the role. And it's that you guys have that trust or bond because things will get hard and you guys are like there for each other and we'll put in that effort. Um, but then on the other side, I had another great friend that was working with us for about a year. Um, and it's a pressure cooker. Um, not only at some point did we have to end up like letting him go, but you know, it's also, you know, then letting go of someone who you had, you know, prior great working relationship with, relationship with, but then was also like a best friend. So um, be careful when working with best friends, but um, letting someone go is definitely, um, you know, a challenging um, thing to go through. I'm sure, I'm sure Alana has gone through at least part of that or has navigated that. So I'm curious, um, you know, if you have a different challenge or uh, what your thoughts are. Oh, I definitely had some uh, uh, some issues with uh, my previous startup in terms of the founding team. That's why I brought up, you know, um, what I learned from that experience was, um, you know, we went into it with with different values. Um, you know, I, I was this kind of naive, bright eyed, uh, <laughs> you know, fresh out of college uh, student who, um, you know, w was going into a business because I wanted to make more sustainable denim and my co-founders wanted to start a fashion company. And those are very different values. <laughs> um, so, you know, we, we ended up, um, you know, having to part ways because we could never um, you know, agree on, you know, how to move the business forward because, you know, they wanted to, uh, be fashion designers and block New York fashion week. And, and I wanted to, uh, license, <laughs> um, and so did, uh, Damon John from Shark Tank, who I pitched to one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, and, and when you have, you know, two different, um, ideas around how to, you know, move the business forward, then sometimes it's, it's, you know, really difficult to move forward. So with the current business that I'm in, um, you know, having learned that lesson from my previous startup, I was adamant <laughs> with my co-founders that we were, you know, in this business for the same, you know, mission and purpose and, and had the same values around it. Um, so I've not had the same issues with, um, you know, growing the business or, or being aligned on on how to move forward. I will say that the challenge is because we have a physical product, um, and normally to to bring a physical product to market, you would uh, you know go to a trade show and you'd get in front of a lot of buyers at the same time. And because of COVID, those events are not happening or they're happening virtually. Um, and so then the uh, the price <laughs> to to do a virtual show like that versus, you know, whether that investment makes sense to, to do it in person, you know, all of a sudden it's like, well, it doesn't make sense to spend that kind of money on an event, you know, that's happening virtually where people aren't going to have the same experience. So you, you have to make the decision, well, now I'm going to go uh, door to door virtually <laughs> to try to reach the same people in a different way. Um, and so that's been challenging because it's a lot more time consuming to um, you know, to find the right people to get in front of the buyers, uh, and, and to, um, and, and to make those kind of personal one-on-one -on -one connections. Uh, but at the same time, I think it can also be to our advantage. Uh, so it, it's different and it's a challenge and it's, it's kind of this question of efficiency, you know, yes, it's a lot more efficient to be in one place and have a lot of people see your product. Um, but I think at the same time, you know, we'll have this advantage over making these these relationships and connections with with people with our customers one on one in a way that uh, we wouldn't have been able to do um, had circumstances been different. Yeah, 
Well, we talked a, uh, a lot about value. The word value keeps coming up with, you know, your values aligning with your product or service that you're offering, your values aligning with your employees. And, uh, uh, you know, our last question, what advice would you give to any of the young entrepreneurs out there, any of the students who are watching right now, uh, if they are looking to one day start their own business or if, if it's already in the works, what advice would you have for them? I'll jump in. Um, I, I, first of all, know what you're passionate about and that you're good at or, or could be good at. Uh, you're willing to uh, invest the time to, to develop the skill set to be good at it. Uh, number two, then go to the place or the company where that happens. For example, my son uh, wanted to be in the film business. Great, you need to go to either Los Angeles, New York, uh, Las Vegas. That's where, the, that's where that happens. That's where the companies are. That's where the action is. Uh, and you need to uh, go there and, and find a, a really good company and get started. Uh, take whatever job you can, even if it's at the low end, which is what he did. But if you're a hard worker, you get noticed and people, um, uh, leaders are always looking for the, the best people and they'll promote you. And uh, he's been very successful in a 20 year career uh, in the film business. Um, I think the, the third thing is, is look for a mentor or especially be careful about your peer group. Um, Dr. David McClellan at Harvard, he, he did research on this. He found that 80% of your success is your, what he calls your reference group, the people you hang out with, your role models, your mentors. Uh, I think for young people in particular, um, uh, pay attention to who you're uh, hanging out with. Uh, hang out with the people that, uh, that uh, you know, are gonna help you get where you wanna go in life and they're doing the things you wanna do. Uh, so um, I think those would be a couple of thoughts that I would have for, for our young people. Great. Larry touched on something, um, Brian and I, um, you know, surround yourself with good advisors. Um, don't be afraid to reach out and get good counsel. And sometimes those people are outside your company. Um, as far as values, um, you know, um, I think in my industry, probably 50% of the industry uh, on their wall or in their conference room has the same values. Um, it's how you embrace them, lead them, that defines your culture. Um, don't pick a value just because it's trendy or popular, um, because they're looking for the leadership to really define that value and how it emulates throughout the company, and that will define your culture. <laughs> um, so we're pretty um, big on our values. Um, we um, promote them and um, teach them all the way up and up and down through you know our thousand employees. Um, because I believe, um, like Alana said, you've got to be on the same page um, moving forward, and that will allow you to accomplish those goals. So pick the right values, but then um, don't forget the behaviors that demonstrate those values as well. Good point. Yeah, add, adding to that, I would just say, um, you know, be authentic and be yourself. Um, I think every every time I've tried to be somebody else, um, that's when <laughs> you know the the doors start shutting. I think, and and people sense that. So whenever I've I've been myself and been comfortable in my own skin, that's when uh, the doors start opening. Um, and I would I would also just say, every experience and every person um, is is somebody that you can learn from. Uh, and something that you can learn from. So, you know, always be like observing everything around you. Um, take every encounter that you have as a learning experience and learn how to reflect on those experience and, and make something with it. So, um, you know, <laughs> I'll have to, to disagree with Larry about knowing your passion, because I think that's something that um, that sometimes you don't know what your passion is. You have to find it or it finds you. Um, but being open to experience and, and being, uh, you know, in a learning mindset where you 
you want to learn from everything and you keep an open mind about who you can learn from and what you can learn from different situations, that's where you can start to find a passion for something and then apply what you've learned from different experiences uh, to fulfill that passion. Um, so my advice is, is really just to, to treat everything as a learning experience and, um, and, and keep an open mind. Be a sponge right now. <laughs> David? I like how um, two of us think it was Alana and Larry, but how they had like contradicting, well, slightly contradicting like uh, perspectives. But I think one thing that you'll learn as well is that there's it's not as like black and white as something like school where there's a right or wrong answer. You'll like naturally find your path to build that muscle where um, you do what's right for you or you, you know, in either path, you'll find that passion and you'll, you know, you'll have that path. So um, I, I just like that that's, you know, just part of the reality I think you'll find in business where there's not, you know, just a, this is the, the one answer. Um, nonetheless, my, my take here, um, it's gonna be a bit more random or like different. Um, Earlier, it was said that um, I believe it was Larry, although I may, may have been wrong here, um, but I believe you said start each morning with uh, like gratitude. I think watching your, your habits, your energy, um, your environment is really important. And one uh, passion that I have that I would uh, recommend is being really aware of your environment. So of course, you know, put in the work, et cetera, but when I'm speaking like being aware of your environment, make sure that that's a powerful environment um, that starts, you know, internally. So make sure that like, you believe in yourself, you're confident, you're putting, you know, you know, you're putting in good work, it's something you believe in, and you're like in a healthy environment internally, then in terms of whether it's like your classroom, your bedroom, your house, whatever the case is, but then eventually, um, you know, it becomes just a really powerful force or environment where, you know, the environment that you're in encourages you to do better work. So when people were saying, um, or the other panels were mentioning, um, having a good support group or friends, et cetera, like that's part of your environment. And instead of it being people that saying, you know, you're starting a business. Do you think that's going to work? It's a pandemic. Why would you do that? Like, that's going to make it that much harder for you to, I mean, unless if you get motivated by proving people wrong, then maybe that's a different angle. But, um, you know, have people with you that really fuel you because that will ultimately get it to the point where you have a real estate building that you own in front of you or a company that you're proud of or things building up. Um, so I would encourage you guys to, you know, be really aware of uh, the environment that you're in and make sure that's one that um, fuels you at at least you're getting to a point where you can build that environment that fuels you. Surround yourself with the right people. Um, thank you guys, all four of you, for your, your perspectives and um, for your time today. Thank you to all of, uh, of you who are watching from home or at work or at school. Um, we really appreciate your time and your input, your participation today. We are out of time. I do want to thank our education sponsor, UMB Bank and Summit Partner Techstars before we go. And I want to turn it back over to Scott Ford of Techstars to close it out. Fantastic, thanks, Brian. What a terrific event. Uh, very inspiring, great advice from uh, from all these entrepreneurs. And it's great seeing all the things that they've done for, for the state of Colorado, so so terrific. So thank you all for uh, presenting. Brian, thank you very much for hosting and uh, everyone have a great day. Thanks. <laughs>